My name is Jacob Crow, and welcome to the Crow's Perch. If my voice is a little raspy today, I've been in a lot of games recently, including our Patreon games, where we are playing Blades in the Dark on our Discord. Our second crew just went through hell and back, and one of them has a substantial wound on their face now. So if that sounds like something that would interest you, be sure to check the Crow's Perch out on Patreon and sign up for those patron games. Application's gonna be a little limited until I can find some other DMs to run other games, but in the meantime we have a Tuesday game and a Thursday game, with a maximum of about 5-6 to six players I'm thinking. Anyway, let's get started with today's story. So, today's story is about a forever DM, of over a decade, who tells a collection of tales about the only player they've ever banned from their table. This is a six-part story, and we're going to condense it all into one video, so be sure to strap yourself in, get nice and comfortable, and bring your Crow's Perch-themed body pillow as we gather up a murder and dive right into this story. Part 1. Okay, so I don't ever use Reddit. In fact, this is one of my only platforms. I'm posting only because, having been a fan of the subreddit for a while, I had to get this out of my system. I'm a long-time D&D fan. In fact, I've been a forever DM for over a decade now, and I love it. I put a lot of work into my games, and trying to deliver an engaging and satisfying narrative to my players. And as a general rule, we have great campaigns and fun sessions. As a general rule, everyone knows what the table expectations are beforehand. Granted, our group has played together for years, and knows what types of games I tend to run. And as a general rule, the game runs smoothly, keeping a decent clip and shying away from obvious game-halting behavior. But every rule has its exception. Since my very first game, one guy has been a reoccurring face in our group, and is the topic of this post. We will just call him CC. CC has a knack for disrupting games, and then swearing it's just what his character would do. Back then, though, I was naive to the that guy stereotype, and came in full of excitement with my first ever character for my first ever game. The party had played a couple of sessions before I joined, but my Warforged was quickly established with the group, and we pressed on to save the world from total destruction. Fast forward through some narrative, and we get to our first full party encounter. Our party, my Warforged Barbarian, a human wizard, a halfling bard, a half-elf fighter, all great guys, ready to our weapons and rolled initiative. Cece, playing an elf druid, opted to ready a firehawk summon should anything move adjacent to him. I thought nothing of it, being new and all. DM at the time breaks down to me how combat works, and I take my first turn, charging in with a rage active and taking a swing at some living skeletons that were firing at us. The wizard went next, shooting off a spell and dealing some decent area damage. Then came Cece. I'm summoning my firehawk, he says with glee. Okay, no problem, DM says. I'll move here, Cece says again with a huge smile on his face and moving his token away from the skeletons and into the far back corner of the large room we were all in. Okay, says DM, and your firehawk? It joins me, CC says, moving the hawk adjacent to him. The round moves around, and we take some decent damage from one of the skeletons exploding. CC comes up in the turn order. Okay, CC, says DM. Do you take any actions? I'm going to sit down and play with my firehawk, CC says under a smirk and a chuckle. I stayed silent, unsure what druids were all about and not wanting to step on CC's toes. But the wizard, an experienced player, says, WTF, dude, go hit them. My druid is a pacifist, argues back Cece. This was new info to us all, as Cece had never mentioned this before. Well, heal then. That's what the bard is for, Cece fires back. There was a moment of quiet before the DM moved on to the next player, but each round went on in much the same fashion. CC choosing every action to sit and play with his Firehawk, and the party asking him to help us out. We were all reaching that point in game, 
where our combat options were getting scarce and our hit points low, but Cece insisted on sitting still. And I wish I could say it got better. But Cece's druid would avoid any sort of actual interaction. Every single encounter. If he wasn't playing with his firehawk, he was eating rations, or playing an instrument, or doing some weird impromptu cheer thing to keep us inspired. The campaign eventually ended, our party barely stopping the BBEG, and after the game ended, DM wanted a break to play a PC. I was the only one showing interest in taking over to run a game, so that's exactly what I did. Cece was a great friend of the DM, and everyone else besides me knew him outside the game. He and the DM had played together for a while, and having been an established part of the group, I had no issues with him rolling up a character to join us, not realizing what was to come for my future games. And this, dear reader, is where my tales of Cece truly begin to take off. Now that you understand the beginnings of my experience with Cece, I can really dive into the near decade of horror stories that came after, and hopefully help you understand why Cece is the only player to this day that I've barred from my games. So far, Cece doesn't sound too bad. It is an unheard of for a player to not understand how combat works in Dungeons and Dragons. Some players go in expecting it to be this super heavy roleplay game where everyone is talking about their feelings in a coffee shop, and for some DMs they can actually run a game like this and make it interesting. However, D&D, at least baseline, is pretty combat-centric. The story is told afterwards or before a combat. Surely CC could have recognized his friends could have died or become seriously wounded without his help. But I feel like the DM could have also made efforts to make this more apparent to Cece. Either way, while annoying, Cece hasn't exactly been given an incentive to do anything else other than continue to be a jackass. But let's not call it just yet. There's still part two. So let's dive into it. Our first campaign was finished, and I was working on my first ever run as our DM. I was definitely that DM that was way overprepared for the game, having maps and calendars, Holidays, moon charts, I mean I really dumped a lot of my focus into this game. And I was excited to get it going, having just seen our party finish a complete adventure successfully. I was running a Forgotten Realms inspired homebrew, had plans to take the party all the way through the Nine Hells, and it started out super well. We had a drow fighter, a human rogue, a tiefling warlock, and Cece's neutral evil half-orc barbarian. The party was largely using their wits to navigate what was looking like an evil PC adventure, but wasn't taking a murder hobo route to succeed. And it was a breath of fresh air. For me coming off the back of our big heroic world saving campaign, we had just finished a few weeks prior. The party had ended up inside the second tier of the Nine Hells, equipped with a letter of passage from Asmodeus and we were seeking the Duke of the Plane of Hell they were currently on, so they could proceed further. Nothing too crazy. I had time enough for crazy stuff. I just wanted to get them down into the tougher levels first. However, when the party finally made it to the Duke's Tower in the middle of the plane, they made a hiccup in the way of a bad persuasion attempt that they themselves had prompted. The Duke demanded to see their right of travel, but the party didn't trust him with it, and wouldn't hand it over. It was looking tense. However, I'm a very narrative-focused DM, and I wouldn't be so rash as to kill a party over a failed persuasion role. The Duke would inevitably relent, not wanting to cross Asmodeus, but was rightfully annoyed at the intruders into his domain, and wanted to air that grievance. Cece was having none of it. If he's not gonna let us in, I'm gonna go into a rage and charge, CC proclaims. Just hold on, man. We need to try to talk him down, replies the warlock. Nah, man. My guy is impatient. He's not used to waiting on people telling him to do things, so he's just gonna go get it. Let me reiterate at this point. 
I am not typically a player character killer. I know how attached players can be to a character, and I don't like to just rob them of that experience without a very good reason. So I tell Cece, look man, out of game. This dude is like a serious deal around the area. Do you need some background info on the Nine Hells? Nope, I just need this asshole to back off. Cece replies with that same smirk starting to come over his face. And that's when I realized that Cece wasn't going to drop this. Well, he stands his ground, demanding you answer why you're here and what Asmodeus would need with your kind, his hand outstretched for your letter. I smack it away, he says as he scoops up a d20. The party sighed. I sighed. You're actually smacking his hand. Or you meant that out of game? Nah, man. I swat that hand out of my space. I couldn't possibly think of a way this didn't result in some serious damage. More than any of the PCs could realistically spare in their predicament. The devil rolled initiative. Cece rolled initiative, apparently unaware or uncaring as to what was about to happen. And as everyone saw clearly coming, the Duke smacked Cece into next week before demanding the party just go on their way and make sure they didn't intrude upon him any further. Yeah. Cece laughed, yelling, What the fuck? as I narrated past him. As soon as there was room for him to chime in, he did. Dude, that was bullshit, he said with a half laugh of disbelief. How the hell did he drop me like that? I explained how the Nine Hells hierarchy worked, and that the devil he hit was basically a second in charge under Asmodeus himself. I told him the math to his death how the attack well exceeded his current hit point pool by more than half of his negative health value, resulting in death. Cece gave it a whatever while we finished the session. The party a little annoyed they were put in such danger. We got him a new character made up. And I had a talk with him, after about my want to really lean into a more serious game, and chalked this up to a misunderstanding. He agreed and took his new character sheet with him. However, his new character didn't hit the table then. He said he wasn't a fan of the hell setting, and would join in after they managed to escape. Which, to his credit, he did. We welcomed the fourth PC because of how Dungeons & Dragons and counterbalancing tends to work out, but this wasn't the last time CC directly placed his party in harm's way. Flock around and find out. And it seems like Cece definitely found out. While punishing, I'm glad he didn't penalize the rest of the party too harshly. For one party member's bold, yet incredibly stupid idea to attack a Duke of Hell. You're in a land of pain and misery, and are negotiating with an agent of vile corruption and sin. And your first instinct is to smack him? Unless you're Doom Guy, there's no world in which that was a good idea. Overall, OP handled this as well as he could have, though I'm surprised CC stuck around. Though, maybe his return wasn't for the best. As this story continues on to part 3. So, from where we last left, as happens, life separated some of our players from the regular group. Graduation, college, jobs, etc. I was hungry to get a game going and was working on another homebrew, inviting anyone I knew that played or might want to play a game, including... <sighs> Cece, who had finished our last campaign on a decent foot some years back. The campaign was centered around nine masks that had to be found by the PCs to prevent an apocalyptic event. It was stated several times that the masks were evil and would seduce its wearers to do terrible things with great power, hence the whole reason they needed to be collected. Now, I'll say ahead of time. Ending aside, this was easily one of my favorite campaigns ever. We had a six-person group full of new players that still play to this day, with huge highs and great impromptu work from everyone involved, 
especially our dragonborn paladin of Bahamut, who made me not hate the trope. Anyways, Cece was a human fighter, trying to be the best arena fighter in the world, and his character was obnoxiously cocky. He would often instigate fights just to show how strong he was, and if a town didn't have an arena, would challenge the biggest guy he could find to a fist fight. This never changed, no matter how much he won or lost, until the party found one of the masks. Cece impulsively decides to don the mask, prompting a wisdom save. He passes, and I tell him that the mask has increased his strength and constitution by one, but decreased his wisdom by one. He doesn't even acknowledge what I said, going on a monologue about how much stronger he is, and how he can't possibly be defeated now, etc, etc. Now, by design, these masks are a trap for those that wear them. They were never meant for PC use. They got an entire lecture about the dangers and magics of the masks, and no one else in the party ever tried to wear one. Which was a smart call. But for Cece, it was too late. Each week that went by, with the mask on, increased all of its effects by one. So strength and con would be boosted by two, and wisdom would drop by two. So then the next week it would be three, then the next week, four, etc. Cece, either uncaring or never cluing into the dangers of this, welcomed the stat inflation, delighted in his new power. Then, one day, Cece failed his wisdom check. I had decided on the powers of the mask well before we started session one. And as it happened, this mask caused a battle fury when its wearer fails its wisdom save. What this meant is that as the group woke up to eat breakfast, the best fighter in the city put on his mask and attacked the nearest creature he could. The mask dominating his mind and driving him temporarily mad. Cece realized what was going on and with wide eyes says to me, Hey, no, wait, that's bullshit. You can't make my character do stuff. What about player agency? He wouldn't just do that. I told him that I know it sucks, but his wisdom was at like a 7 at this point, and he failed an honest roll versus the mask's attack. It had weeks to make itself more finely attuned to him, and this was the culmination of all of these things. It's fucking dumb is what it is, Cece replies. How long am I like this? Till the mask comes off or you're unable to act, I said. The party came up with a plan to get the mask off him, before he dropped their cleric and managed to calm him down. But I could tell Cece was annoyed out of game, and honestly, I did feel bad making him feel like I jerked control away from him. But I also knew it was my job to adjudicate fairly, and his actions bore consequences. I didn't realize how mad he was, though, that inside, Cece was planning his biggest stunt yet, the cantaloupe incident, which we will get to in part four. But before we do, oh, Cece, my dude, my child, my son, when you see a magic mask, please check if it's cursed first. Didn't you watch that Jim Carrey movie? CC seems to act like a sore loser whenever something doesn't turn out his way, and though I personally would have made it a bit more of a tug-of-war over CC's character's body and the cursed mask, I get what the OP was going for. So, let's see where this cantaloupe incident goes as we move on to part 4. So as I said in the previous post, CC and I had some small friction about a wisdom save, and his character raging out, and I had thought we smoothed everything over with one another, having explained how I was handling things like cursed items more thoroughly. The campaign was one where the heroes were setting out to collect a series of cursed masks across the world, and had come to a small volcanic island. The mask presumed to be inside the volcano itself. This led them down into a small cave system, that looked more like some sacred site the further in they went. 
Now at this time, most of our group were cigarette smokers, and we would take a break every two hours or so to choke one down real quick, bathroom break, etc., before we started back in on the game. And it was during one game where everyone but Cece and one of our newbies went outside to smoke, that Cece, I can only assume, still annoyed about the wisdom save from a week prior, concocted the cantaloupe maneuver. We all came inside after a few minutes and sat back down to start. I tell the group they entered a circular chamber. Oil pots lined the walls, each with a pile of human bones inside. At the center of the room was a throne made of rock, where a full human skeleton sat limp, a dagger through its chest cavity. Obvious trap is obvious. I'm going to roll an investigation check, I think, says our wizard clearly trying to use his brain to work through the room. Cantaloupe! yells Cece, with a big smile, as he looks right at the other player that didn't go outside with us. The other player smirks at first, then awkwardly looks at the rest of the group, who was as lost as I was. I, uh, I don't know, <laughs> he says. Well then, I go and pull the dagger out of the skeleton's chest. Cece proclaims, and that's when it hit me, that these two had planned to mess things up while we were outside. Cece indeed grabbed the dagger, triggered a really tough fight with fire-covered skeletons, nearly dropping both the assassin and the wizard, and when the fight was done, Cece laughed. Cantaloupe was our keyword, he chuckled, but new player chickened out. There was clearly some mirth in his words. I ready my weapon on CC, says the assassin. Wait, what the fuck? CC says. My drow is tired of your dead weight in our party. You nearly got two of us killed being careless. Now, raise your arms, or I'll cut you where you stand, the assassin replied. CC looked at me, then the newbie, then the wizard, the wizard, also mad that he came so close to death, summoned a wall at the mouth of the cavern, trapping Cece. For once, he didn't have anything to say. Instead, furrowing his brow and checking his character sheet over. Whatever, dude, I was just trying to have some fun. Sheesh. The assassin then rolled to hit, amplifying his damage as much as he could. It wasn't hard for him to cut Cece down. And I can't lie, I found it amusing that the party was holding him accountable for a change. Cece slammed his character sheet down and got his stuff together, telling us he may as well not play if he didn't get to have fun. We all said it ruined the fun for us, having someone purposefully activating traps and putting them in danger like that. For those wondering why this was tolerated for so long, you've got to understand that outside of D&D, Cece didn't take games this way. We all played Magic the Gathering together, World of Warcraft, board games, etc. We always had a fun, competitive way about us, even Cece. And I think this is part of why I kept him around for so long. Well, that and not knowing too many players at that time. But anyways, this was the last game we played of this three-year-long campaign. I guess we all just lost the immersion or something? Too hard to keep going. As I said in the previous post, I find this in hindsight to be one of my favorite campaigns. However, there were other games to play, and more messes for CC to get us all into. But those are stories for another post. Sounds like the players are starting to get sick of CC's antics too. Now I understand playing up to your character's weaknesses, but CC clearly triggered the trap on purpose to piss off the entire party. Once again, he dug himself into a hole, only to be surprised when the entire party decided to bury him in it. But it looks like Cece's about to dig himself out of the game entirely. As we move on to part five of this story. I moved out of state for a couple of years for school, coming back after a time to find a giant tabletop sized hole in my life. Coming off the back of an HP Lovecraft binge, I assembled those of the Old Guard still around the area for a game of Call of Cthulhu. I had only ever played the system once, and never GM'd it, 
so I opted to run a module. For those wondering why CC was brought back to play, let me provide some context. CC was, at this point, a friend outside of D&D that I had known for close to a decade at this point. We shared tons of mutual friends. We saw each other almost weekly because of this, and largely, he didn't have quite such a blase attitude with other stuff like he does tabletop games. And I guess I had myself convinced that at some point, and maybe with a horror-style game like Call of Cthulhu, CC would decide to shake it up and maybe try to finish a game. Nope. CC comes in with a Japanese character who works as a Yakuza in America, trying to help operations abroad, or something. I couldn't really tell you what his backstory was, because all that CC did was start right off the bat with the most horrible, stereotypical Asian accent you can picture, and made sure all the racist humor that could entail came with it. CC is one of those anime superfans, with a borderline Japanese fetish, so this really took me by surprise when we got going. Anyway, I had planned a decently long first session with a hook ending, and figured I'd get us through this first game, then talk with CC about the character who made everything overly complicated for a game set in the Prohibition era. So that's what we did. The rest of the party largely ignored CC, and instead focused on the big mystery of the game. Afterward, I went outside to smoke, and got CC to come out with me, where I told him his character was a bit over the top. I explained that even though we had no Asian players, it was still awkward to have a bunch of stereotypes getting thrown around, and that his accent was so over the top, I had a hard time understanding him. Yeah, but wasn't Lovecraft a racist? He asked. I mean, yeah? Kinda. That doesn't mean we have to play it up, though. Kinda? Come on, OP. I mean, are we gonna talk about the cat? Oh, Lovecraft and his cat... Mm, um, his cat's name was, uh, this is a picture of H.P. Lovecraft with his cat. What was his name? Oh, no. I'm not playing anything up, bro. I'm just playing my character, he says. I can't understand your character is my point, I said. I'm not saying that you have to, like, Roll something new? But things would run smoother if you tone it down a bit. That's all I'm saying, my guy. He agrees after a quick moment of silence and said he'd tone it down. And he did, when we played the next week. Only for him to halt the entire game. The party had gathered clues leading to a building called the Juju Hut. All roads lead to the Juju Hut. After a less than successful meeting with the building owner, the party had to find a way to sneak in, but went to bed for the night to think it over. My character's gonna sneak out while everyone sleeps to, uh, do Yakuza business. Oh, well, okay, I said. Can we do the roleplay in private? I want to keep it a secret. Sure, I said. I could use a cigarette anyway. We step outside, and Cece begins to tell me how he wants to try and infiltrate the Juju Hut all by himself. I go with it not wanting to kill his momentum. He goes to the window, peeking around and finding the doors and windows locked. The party had a member with lockpicks, but Cece was not that character. So I don't see a way in? He asks. Not right off, I say, trying to keep it vague. Well, fuck it then. I'm gonna burn it down. Yep. He said he wants to burn it down. Are... are you being serious? I asked. I knew the answer because he was chuckling to himself as he said it, with that same grin as always. But I had to verify. Hell yeah, dude. My guy was an ass anyway, so it's whatever. My guy is a Yakuza. He doesn't give a shit. Then describes exactly that. Using a cigar lighter and motor oil, he gets a fire going and destroys the building. Cops are called, and the one Japanese dude in the city running from the scene is soon found by police. The party lost their lead in a literal puff of smoke. And at that point, 
I knew we were all checking out. So that was the last session of that game. I have yet to run that game again, though I really want to. I love the module and the system, and still haven't gotten off my Lovecraft kick. Cece has yet to ever explain why exactly he thought burning down the Juju Hut was a good idea, outside of it's what his character would want to do. And though this is past the point where most DMs would finally throw in the towel with Cece, I still have one more tale of his antics. The tale that finally made me give up on Cece. If the game was inspired by a racist, that means I can be one too. Yeah, that sounds like that's how that works. Cece, you're making a mile-long logical leap to make this character a thing. And look, I love accents. I do accents all the time. Accents are fun. And you're always going to get someone who says your accent sucks, and someone else who's going to say that your accent sounds incredible. There's even nothing wrong with a joke accent. Just read the room. Is this offensive for no other reason than just being offensive? Just don't do it. No one's holding you at gunpoint, forcing you to do an accent. And unfortunately, there's one more story left. So without further ado, let's gather up the last of the murder and dive right into the final chapter of this story. I took a break from the DM chair for about six months and played an actual PC for a change and ended up birthing one of my favorite characters ever. To this day, my group has fond memories of that game, but after it ended, the DM didn't have anything else prepped. And so I took over the helm again and brought out a new Forgotten Realms-inspired homebrew. Now, Cece was present for this game, mostly because the guy that owned the house we played at was the last DM. And since Cece has always just sort of been around, he played in our previous game and knew we were going to start a new one. And I'm a guy with a big heart. I didn't just want to say, sorry Cece, everyone gets to join but you. But I did explain that I wanted a more serious tone, because I love grimdark fantasy. We all agreed and began rolling characters. That's when Cece gives me his character pitch. Okay. He's a samurai from a land with no magic. I thought for a second, I'm fine with a samurai, but you know that the whole planet is magical, right? Yeah, but he wouldn't know anything about that because his country doesn't know about magic. Right. But like, the trees and wind and everything is magical, I said. Do you have an idea for like, why their country doesn't know magic? I don't know. There's like this other country that doesn't like them and took them over, so now my guy and his three friends are on the run. Only his friends got separated, so now he's on his own, trying to save his country. Right, I said. So I did what any obsessive DM would do, and I turned out an entire history of two nations. One subjugating the other with anti-magical sigils and artifacts. I caught a wind of inspiration with it, and really set out to make Cece's backstory something he could chew, if he wanted, hoping maybe he'd keep his head in the game. The plan was to make him a lycanthrope, something Cece had often mentioned wanting to do, and let him lead his horde of werebears against the rival country to free his people. In hindsight, I should have known giving Cece the powers of a werebear was a doomed idea. The party had wound up, in a time-forgotten dwarven settlement, inside a mountain. They were wary of the foreigners, but were convinced to, at least, let them lodge for the night. That evening, Cece decides his character needs to sneak out. I need to bolster my werebear forces, he says, so I'm gonna sneak out into any house I can get into. He passes his rolls and makes it into a bedroom where a female dwarf is sleeping. Okay, he says, I'm gonna transform into my hybrid form, so my head is a bear head, literally his words, and bite her, so she transforms into a werebear. Are you sure? Yeah, man. And where do you bite her? The neck. Duh. Now, I'm not sure if Cece knew he was different from a vampire or not. That where the bite was really didn't matter. But regardless... He has a freaking bear head right now. Are you positive you bite her neck? Yeah, dude. 
I can tell that the other players knew what I was thinking. Okay, I sigh. You bite the dwarf's neck with your bear maw, and she dies because that's what happens when a bear bites down on your neck. I was amazed that once again he had managed to totally muck things up, as the dwarves immediately seized the party for murder. Cece was offered by the party as recompense and had to do a side quest to regain some trust. But Cece was fuming. So do I need a new character? He asks. Eh, probably, I said. I can't imagine they'd let you live after that. So he goes outside and comes in ten minutes later with his latest idea. It was a reference to the game The Last of Us. His character was named Joel, but he said his character is Mexican, so it's pronounced Jole. Come on, Cece, they didn't even do that for Mexican Dristo Erden. And yep, it was a super stereotypical character and accent. But what really made me snap was when he said he was looking for clickers in a Hispanic accent that intentionally made it sound like a certain N-word slur. Oh boy. That was the final inch that crossed the line. Okay, you're not playing this character, I said. What do you mean? Cece asks with an overly innocent tone. You keep making these super racist characters, and now you're basically saying the N-word. And I'm not about it. It's not funny. It's not fun. It sucks having everything disrupted when the party tries to make any sort of headway. I'm not doing it. Dude, what the fuck ever? I'm just trying to have fun and made a damn joke, he says. It's fucking dumb. You made me kill that dwarf anyway. I just wanted to make her a werebear. I said, I'm not doing it, dude. We are done for tonight and got my things, and left for the evening to calm down. Our game ended that night, and was never picked back up, largely because I checked out on my end. We didn't talk for a while. I was too grossed out by his conduct to handle that, but we have many mutual friends, so contact was inevitable. I've seen Cece plenty of times since then, and we can still hang out cordially without much static. But I've never had him to one of my games since. Moving to Roll20 has helped immensely with this. And I'm happy to say our group just finished Ravenloft after a steady six-month slog. And are now on our way through Icewind Dale. It's been super refreshing having a party that clicks with itself. And it's been refreshing to DM without CC. This was definitely a long ride and the DM was far more patient than I could even imagine being, for keeping Cece around as long as they did. While I disagree with the whole bear bite situation here in this last story, as the consequence wasn't articulated clearly enough in my opinion, I can imagine he and the rest of the players were already exhausted by this point. In the comments, the OP talks about how the person who hosted their games was a personal friend of Cece's, and there was an expectation that if there was a gathering of the friend group, Cece would be there, even if he would consistently ruin D&D. To any other DM or player experiencing something similar, I'll say this. D&D shouldn't be the end-all be-all of your relationships. If a close friend is a bad player, there's nothing you can do to fix that. You can help, sure, but the only way a problem player like that is going to change as if they want to change. And Cece clearly didn't see that he was the problem. Not all of your friends are going to be a good fit for your D&D group. And yes, feelings will be hurt. But what's worse? Having to tell your friend that you have your group picked out, and you don't think they'd be a good fit for it? Or dealing with their BS for an entire year, as you desperately attempt to finish a campaign, all while your party is miserable? There is a correct answer. Though you could probably say it nicer than I did. And with that, I hope you enjoyed today's collection of stories. I'm sorry for missing last week's deadline, but I hope I made it up to you with this incredibly long series of stories. And before we end today's story, I would like to make a special mention to the Crow's Perch patrons. Our Burbs, R6, and Reuven Gritters. And coming up next, the Counts of Quills, Kooky Spooks, 
Rikus, Mexican, Haley, Zero Fang, and Netscape Navigator. And what's a Crow's Perch video without mentioning the Barons of Beaks? Vincent, Den of the Drake, McYeatley, and Anya. In the grim dark future of the 42nd millennium, there are only burbs. Introducing the Dukes of Feathers, Vanishing Thoughts, and Agroth. Thank you guys so, so much for your support. There's a lot more of you than I thought there'd ever be. And if you yourself would like to become a Crow's Perch patron, be sure to visit the Crow's Perch Patreon, link down below. It helps support the channel, and hopefully it's going to start paying for subscriptions like to Adobe, paying for art for the channel, new burbs, and even using some of that art to make some merch. But before we're done here, it seems like we've missed Art of the, of week. the week. This week's Art of the Week comes from the Duke of Feathers' Vanishing Thoughts, delivering two distinctly cursed images. The first was inspired by the video Cringy Cat Girls, Daddy Milkies, and ERP. In this incredibly disturbing piece, Den of the Drake and myself are portrayed with cat ears. I appear to be wielding, or do wielding, two flintlock pistols. <laughs> what the hell is with my eyes? And I just now noticed that instead of tail feathers, I have a cat tail. And Drake does as well. What <laughs> the fuck am I looking at? <laughs> <clears throat> and if you thought the first image was so deliciously terrible, then wait until you see the second one. After a previous video where we delved into a story about a manic diaper fetishist problem player, Vanishing Thoughts decided to draw the crow in a diaper. Thanks. I hate it. If you would like your art to be featured on next week's Art of the Week, be sure to submit it to the Crow's Perch Discord's art channel. I normally pick art that's themed around the channel, but if I see something particularly amazing, I will feature it here as well. Thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you next time as the crow flies.